Welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing the implications of Egypt's turmoil on the region. But first, let's see what Russians think about the Middle East peace process. What does the crisis in Egypt mean for Israeli-Palestinian relations? Both Israeli and Palestinian leaders developed what many call a cold peace under the Mubarak regime. For almost 30 years, Egypt has been Israel's strongest ally in the Middle East. The Public Opinion Foundation asked Russians if there could be a lasting peace among the conflicting parties in the region. 34% said peace is possible. However, another 32% disagree. It remains to be seen how regime change in Egypt will impact the region. Back to you, Peter. And now we are joined by Gil Troy in Jerusalem. He is a professor of history at McGill University. Uh, professor Troy, thank you very much for being with us here. Uh, in scouring the, uh, the Israeli papers yesterday and this morning, I thought it was quite interesting that a lot of editorials are asking, really ironically in many ways, can Israel make peace only with dictators? And of course, we're talking about the political changes happening in, in Egypt. And it is kind of you know, interesting is that Israel does have a lot of understandings. It has a peace treaty with uh, Egypt. Egypt, it has understandings with Jordan, but w can it really deal with a democratically elective government because it doesn't want to deal with uh, uh, Hezbollah in, uh, in uh, Lebanon? The late Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel, said that you have to make peace with your enemies. And unfortunately, in the Middle East, you have to have a corollary to that, which is unfortunately, you have to make peace with dictators because they're leading your neighbors. The Israelis don't get to choose uh, who their neighbors are. So what's happened is, is that, you know, they made peace with the Egyptians, they made peace with the Jordanians, and now there's concern that if there is this popular revolt, and we don't know which direction it'll go, but if the popular revolt leads not to a true democracy, not to a democracy which doesn't war on its neighbors, but um, has a, let's say, Islamist ideology, then there's a danger that this whole peace process, which has been the center for stability for 30 years, will be uh, put in danger. And that's the current concern with Israel. Hezbollah uh, is a problem because they have an exterminationist ideology. They're the ones who want to wipe out the Jewish state, so it's kind of hard to be friends with them. Okay, but uh, if I go to Joel, I mean, wouldn't it be ultimately better for Israel to have to deal with democracies and if the U.S. stops supporting these dictatorships and let popular governments come into being, a, 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 you know, this, this is what we say we're all about, but the rhetoric and actions don't always meet. But it would be easier in the end, in theory, for de uh, democracies to negotiate with democracies. That's what we preach. In the, in the long run, of course, that's true. Uh, a democratic Egypt or democratic regimes in other Arab countries would be much more stable in the long run than autocracies. What Professor Troy has uh, said is really uh, a straw man. Uh, there isn't going to be, as a result of this popular uprising in Egypt, a radical Islamic regime coming to power. The Muslim Brothers have, for years now, uh, indicated that they are willing to participate in the parliamentary process. They ran in the 2005 elections, had 88 uh, representatives elected to the parliament, about 20 percent of the parliament. The Mubarak regime considered that to be too much and held even more undemocratic parliamentary elections in December 2010 than uh, had been held before. So first of all, the Muslim Brothers are uh, saying, at least, and based on their practice in the 2005 parliamentary session, uh, actually acting uh, according to democratic procedural rules. Um, they have lots of criticisms of Israel, but uh, that can't be a reason why they can't participate in political life in Egypt. Moreover, the Muslim Brothers have agreed that Mohammed al-Baradai, who is a liberal mm. secularist, a Nobel Peace Laureate and former head of the International Atomic Energy Commission, should lead the transition to a new democratic regime in Egypt. And that's very clever on their part because he's already announced that should he do that, uh, he would arrange elections that would allow everyone from the Muslim Brothers to the Communists to participate. I can't see why anyone would have a problem with that.
Yosef, you know a lot, a lot about the, uh, the plight of the Palestinians. In, in light of what's happening in Egypt and Tunisia, some of the other protests uh, that we've seen in the region, and the Palestine papers, do you think the Palestinian people now, or look at that example and say, we need new elections, we need an elections not only in the West Bank but in Gaza, true elections where they reflect the people, including Hamas, where the, you guys, the Fatah and Hamas could have to somehow come to some kind of agreement, and then deal with the Israeli government government with a popular mandate because the, the Palestine papers cer certainly don't uh, does not show a popular mandate uh, representing the Palestinian people when, when the Palestinian negotiators deal with Israel sure let me let me just begin by saying in regards to the uh, Israeli Egyptian peace treaty uh, that when that was signed uh, Yasser Arafat uh, when he was in Beirut at the time uh, stated that you know they can sign whatever they want a false peace will not last and, and here we are today realizing that uh, agreements made with uh, dictators that do not necessarily represent the will of of the people of the countries which they rule uh, will not last and we are perhaps at the brink of having to rethink completely uh, how uh, Egyptian-Israeli uh, relations will be. Um, the Palestinians are in a very similar situation uh, with the uh, division within Palestinian society. Uh, and unless, uh, as, as you mentioned, they have a truly representative leadership, uh, they will not be able to uh, come to a, uh, an agreement with the Israelis or, or achieve their own national uh, liberation. And certainly this is a, a feeling that is uh, apparent not only among Palestinians, but throughout the Arab world now, particularly since uh, the successful uh, revolution in Tunisia. So uh, people throughout the Arab world, including uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories, are thinking about who represents them and if the people who represent them currently are acting in the best uh, interests of the people. Professor Troy, if I can go back to you. I mean, don't you think Israel is kind of in an awkward position where even um, uh, Egypt's great ally, the United States, the president of the United States, is saying transition needs to be done now. And then when you look at the Israeli, me Israeli media saying, you know, don't, you know, stop being so hard on Mubarak and stuff like that. that. That's kind of an awkward position to be put in when everyone in the region is cheering the end of this dictatorship. And Israel is the sole party there saying, well, or maybe not the sole party, maybe other dictatorships are worried too. But um, uh, I mean, is, how does this change Israel's foreign policy towards its neighbors? Because you know, the, the democracy may be in the air and, or so has some form of democracy, and it may even involve, obviously, Islamic elements. I mean, this, does Israel have to reconsider the, its entire foreign policy to its region, to, it, to its neighbors? I, I think there is a major reassessment going on right now. Uh, first of all, let me say that I absolutely agree with the other two that the best case scenario would be a true democracy in Egypt, among the Palestinians, uh, in Syria, in Lebanon, true democracy, which would mean even if there were Islamist elements, the elements weren't dictatorships, the elements didn't use violence to advance their goals, and the elements didn't call for the extermination of Israel. That truly would be a fantastic scenario. And if these riots and if these uprisings lead to that, then I'm you know, going to be extremely happy. And I think most Israelis will be extremely happy. Notice that you're talking about and you're reacting to the Israeli media. The Israeli government has been extremely quiet, which is rare for a government which is the, such a messy coalition and is not known for its discipline. They're being quiet because they know that ultimately they can't control what's going on. And let's roll back the clock 30 years ago. If 30 years ago the Israelis had said, you know what, we're not going to make peace with the Egyptians because they're a dictatorship, everybody would have said, look, the Israelis are obstructionist. The Israelis have had to deal with the realities of the Middle East. The realities of the Middle East are tough, complex. So right now there's what I consider hope and skepticism. There's skepticism because, yes, for the first time in 30 years, this Egypt-Israeli peace treaty might be questioned, might be shaken. Uh, and Israelis are, you know, have lost their illusions. 30 years ago, they hoped there'd be a true peace. There'd be a peace between the peoples and not just government to government. And that hasn't panned out, uh, largely because of Egyptian anger at Israel as opposed to Israeli anger at Egypt. So that's number one. Number two, is there is hope. There's hope that perhaps there'll be a major shift. And we're talking about, and we've learned this during the Bush administration, not just fake democracy where there's an occasional vote and then dictatorships uh, in name, basically, but we're talking about true democracy, respect for minorities, respect for women, respect for gays, respect for your neighbors. And then, of course, we'll have a whole new Middle East. 
Okay, Yusuf, I go to you. Do you agree with what uh, we just heard there? I mean, um, a lot of people would say that uh, Palestinians are not, uh, they're a minority, you know, treated very badly uh, under Israeli control. I mean, th what I'm saying is, is that, you know, democracy can benefit everyone, but it, it, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a very friendly community. I mean, there are going to be certain core values that people have, and a lot of people in the region, and especially when you look at the, uh, the Palestinians and you look at the Egyptians that look at Gaza, I mean, it's not going to be a cozy relationship, but do you think that it, with a democratic wave that uh, the, all of the countries, including Israel, can have a pragmatic, start working on a pragmatic um, understanding without necessarily liking each other? Sure. I, I would just say to Professor Troy that for the past 43 years between the river and the sea, there has been one, one ultimate authority, and that is the state of Israel, and half of the people uh, which uh, it uh, controls within those territories have no uh, rights within the Israeli political system. So I think that democracy there would do a great deal to push uh, uh, the entire conflict to a resolution. But, but you know, that's not something that we've uh, seen either. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's a reality that, uh, you know, Israel made peace with the Egyptians uh, when they did because of uh, the reality of power politics, mm -hmm. not because they sought a genuine peace with the Egyptian people. If they sought a genuine peace with the people throughout the region, they would have found a genuine solution to the conflict that they have with the Palestinians, the ongoing occupation and colonization of Palestinian land, the ongoing uh, Judaization of I Jerusalem. I wish we could go on and on, gentlemen. I really appreciate it, but we've run out of time. World. Many thanks to my guests today in Jerusalem. Stand Stanford and in Washington, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, Crosstalk Rules.